So thank you to everyone uh, who is joining us today um, to learn about the uh, amazing strike uh, and transformation that is happening now in the UAW. Um, I'm Lisa Shu. I'm an organizer with Labor Notes. I'm going to be facilitating this call um, and introducing the other speakers. Um, uh, I'm just going to start with a quick overview uh, of what happening right now. Um, so uh, Labor Notes has been uh, covering the strike pretty closely. You should definitely go to um, our website to read about breaking news um, and investigative stories we've been doing. Um, so briefly, the UAW has launched a major strike at select plants of all of the big three automakers for GM and Solantis. Um, last Thursday, 13,000 auto workers walked out at midnight um, and yesterday, they were joined by thousands more at GM and Solantis at 38 highly profitable parts distribution centers across the country. Um, and also yesterday, the UAW announced some substantial uh, progress at the bargaining table with Ford, which is why they were spared from the walkout yesterday. So there's some evidence that, that the stand-up strike escalation strategy is working. So examples of what um, Ford has agreed to would be the reinstatement of COLA, which was suspended in 2009, um, some historic improvements on job security, including the right to strike over plant closures during the life of the agreement, which is a first for the UAW, as well as two years of income security and healthcare for workers who are laid off. Um, the immediate conversion of all temps have worked for at least 90 days upon ratification of the contract. Um, and there were no concessions on the table. Um, so uh, we have a new UAW president, Sean Fain, who is promising to kick the ass of the billionaire class. And this is also being reflected in um, a new spirit of solidarity and class struggle um, among the rank and file. And we're going to hear today about the incredible amount of creativity and militancy um, that uh, has been unleashed. So, you know, we saw the video about the Jeep convoys between plants. Um, we're going to hear about uh, practice pickets and uh, the collective refusal of voluntary overtime. And it's inspiring not just workers around the country, but all around the world. So the UAW has received solidarity messages from workers in Mexico and Brazil, South Africa, Malaysia. So it's uh, it's truly incredible. So let me um, just quickly share uh, the agenda with all of you. Um, okay. So um, we're first going to hear from James Slaughter of Labor Notes about, you know, how did we arrive at this um, historic moment in the union? Uh, we're going to hear from UAW Region 1 Director LaShawn English about the UAW's strike strategy. And then we're going to hear from some amazing rank and file workers at the big three about what they're doing on the picket lines and in the plants uh, to win this strike. Um, and then we're going to hear about me from members of UAWD, the Reform Caucus in the UAW, about what they're doing, uh, what UAWD is doing to build up the strike uh, with some uh, really uh, uh, interesting tactics. Um, and then um, at the end, we'll go to Q&A, and you'll be able to submit questions um, through the Q&A function uh, uh, in the, uh, which should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen and uh, in the chat. Um, and then one more thing I'll show you, if you haven't seen this map yet, no, is uh, um, this is a map of all the big three work sites um, across the country. And the ones that are uh, out on strike now are marked with little lightning bolts. So this is available um, uh, on the Labor Notes website. So you know, take note of the uh, site closest to you and, and join uh, workers on the picket line. Um, Okay, so uh, I think we'll just get to it and go to our first speaker, um, James Slaughter, uh, who is one of the founders of Labor Notes and has been covering uh, the UAW for a very long time. And she's going to 
and she's a former auto worker as well. And she's going to um, tell us a bit about, you know, how, how did this all come about? Yeah, my job is to talk about how we got to this beautiful place that we're in today. The excitement here in Detroit is just something I've never seen before. So Labor Notes, as many of you know, for years we've been an advocate. If your union is breaking your heart, it's your job to organize to try and fix it. If necessary, you form a rank and file caucus. You organize your fellow workers to fight the boss. In other words, you do what the union ought to be doing. And if necessary, you run for office, you take over and you do it right. Our friends in the um, caucus of rank and file educators in the Chicago Teachers Union, they're sort of a textbook example of how to do that. And you can read about them in our book, uh, How to Jumpstart Your Union. And similarly, none of this would be happening today in the UAW if it wasn't for the fact that four years ago, a small group of activists founded a, a reform caucus called Unite All Workers for Democracy, UAWD. This is the caucus that President Sean Fain belongs to and it has a majority on the executive board. It won, won all the seats that it uh, ran for last year and this year. So if UAWD had not existed and if it hadn't organized really hard, this current fight the one we're seeing that has the potential to shake up so much in the labor movement, it would not be happening. Uh, in the face of these record profits that we're seeing from the big three automakers, I have zero confidence that the old guard in the union would have known how to try to get a fair share of that for the members or would have bothered to try. So a little bit of history, this fight started with the fight for democracy. Starting in 2019, UAWD, campaign to win members' right to vote themselves on their top officers because there was no accountability under the old system and they won that vote. And then, although the caucus was still pretty small, they had to put up or shut up. Uh, so they ran seven people for the executive board, not really knowing what would happen. And their slogan was no tears, no corruption, no concessions. And this was coming after decades of concessions that you probably know about. You'll probably hear about uh, more about that from other people. A lot of bad stuff. Well, lo and behold, the members wanted a fresh start. Enough of them did to get rid of the old corrupt regime and their concessionary ways, and they voted UAWD in. The turnout was small, the margin was small, but it was enough. So then one of the first things they did was try to push for drastically increasing strike pay because they wanted to make it easier to strike, not harder to strike. And at the convention, um, they won that strike pay would start on the first day of the strike instead of the eighth day. And we're seeing that now. So UAWD came into office with a membership where the majority had not even voted and they were demoralized. They were cynical about their union. And yet Sean Fain and all the rest of the members of UAWD, they believe that they could win people over and activate them, people who've been uninvolved, skeptical, even despairing about their union. They said, if we do this right, we can get people involved. So they set to work building a contract campaign, which we saw this summer that included pledge cards that people were willing to strike, practice picketing, lots of communication, lots of media, and that built up to the strike that started last week. They were really just pushing to do what they had promised and they went directly to the rank and file and went around any uh, officers that were not on the program. And the results have been just stunning as you're gonna hear in a minute. So for me, a lesson of this is to grab your chance, even if you're not quite ready. UAWD was small, but it was bold. Uh, they had the brains, uh, members of that caucus, to pick uh, a leader who was not going to back down, Sean Fain, somebody who was not going to let himself get sucked into the muck at union headquarters, which is what sometimes happens. And another lesson is to learn from the people who went before. As Lisa said, I've been covering this for a very long time. There were earlier reform movements in the UAW, and some of the leaders of UAWD go all the way back to the 1980s. There was always somebody in that union, even if it was small, that was trying to keep the 
spark of reform alive, uh, even when it seemed like the old guard was going to be a permanent fixture. So now, of course, UAWD is in it with both feet. You're going to hear about what people are doing. Um, for example, campaigning to get the people who are still working to uh, refuse voluntary overtime. And they are well aware that despite this big victory they had at the top, there's the work that they need to do to transform the union is, is really just beginning. So that's one topic for our town hall today. Some of our speakers are in UAWD, some of them are not, but they're all working together to win this strike. Let's hear how they're doing it. Back to Lisa. Thank you, Jane. Um, I also just want to shout out over 150 participants on the webinar. Um, not everyone can see how many here, but there are a lot of people tuning in and watching um, what's happening in the UAW right now. It's such an important fight. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to LaShawn English. So LaShawn is the director of UAW Region 1, which is that spans the Detroit area. Um, and uh, she ran on the same slate, the same reform slate backed by UAWD as Sean Fain. So she is one of the new wave of reformers we swept into the um, uh, top leadership of the UAW. And she's gonna tell us a bit about um, the UAW strike strategy and you know how things are changing. So uh, go ahead, LaShawn. Good afternoon, everyone. And anybody that's on here that's on strike, we really, really appreciate the strength that you guys are showing. Um, I have to say, um, as Jane said, I am so proud by the energy and the commitment from the membership. I don't know if this, the membership, I think they've been ready and overwhelming, ready to fight. And we're just looking for someone to fight. Um, some of the strategy, I can't say, um, as it was stated, that we all ran on a slate and we had uh, numerous talks about, because they we went around the country and campaigned and we heard everyone's concerns. And, you know, we were tired of being here in concessions at the concessions or different issues or, you know, tears. I myself was a union president. I have been on national negotiations before. And I can say these strategies right now are, are, are great. I wish I had on when I was a national negotiator. Because as a national negotiator, I can tell you, we were we would start in June and the company will not, we will have meetings scheduled. They wasn't coming to the table. You will spend 12, 16, 17 hours sitting in the building waiting to even talk about demands. There was no urgency from the company or either side. Um, we were never told full disclosure of the president's demand. Um, so that was a problem too, because you really never know what the big table was doing compared to the little table. And so some of the discussions, because Sean also was on the negotiation teams before, and he was also in 2015 when I was there, he was on staff. And that was some of our frustrations of some of the things that we would fight and argue about wasn't getting hurt. I can say in 2015, I might've been the only person at the time that was a national negotiator told them that contract was going to go down because you were not listening to the membership and and which it did and it took them to come back so the strategy that sean is doing um is phenomenal because he's keeping all the negotiators it's no separation there's no separation between the the gm negotiators the four negotiator and the chrysler the stellantis i should say negotiators in the past you were in one building, everybody was separate building, and no one kept in contact as to what the other departments or other um, big three were doing. So you always thought you had true, true solidarity to say it was pattern and bargaining, but it's really not if you don't know what the other team is really bargaining about. So all our so from the beginning, when your members' demands were came in, every single vice president made sure that every single demand was heard. They did not allow them to just pass all the demands without discussion. Every single demand was passed or was got passed, I should say, was heard and gave a reason 
which gives it a story as to why that demand was very important. Um, Sean was not actually the president at the time, but he was um, there on a couple of them. And he, he made sure that was the thing, you know, he really made sure. Then once he became the president, he went back and said, listen, we need these people demand set. Following that of the strategy, which I thought was very, when we did not shake their hand, oh my God. And I was at all three. And the company was not used to that. The the surprise and, and the shock from the company, it, it, it actually made them upset. They were very angry, actually. It was just like very angry, like no handshaking until you can get us a deal. That's when we celebrate. So he's changing to not feel like a partnership because it makes our members feel like we're in bed with them. Until you can treat our members right, then we can shake hands. So those are some of the strategies that have changed there. Um, and then when he did the president's demands, he changed them to from president's demands to members' demands. First time in history ever happened, he brought every single negotiator in and he read to them the members' demands. What do we want? So we're being heard on that part. Those are the strategies that's never happened before. And then organizing the, the membership, of signing the cards. Because as a negotiator, i am be honest, if you're not part of, I'm a skilled trade, so I may not be well-versed in another area. But when you start hearing your stories and the membership's action, it brings compassion. So that's another strategy that is being used because we need to know each other's story. The union is bigger than an individual. It's together with brothers and sisters. So those are strategies that we're using. Hearing the stories, hearing the mom and pop. Everyone has a story of something that happened to them. Because we have to go back to caring about everybody. Those are, those are strategies. Because again, we all been broken so long that we've forgotten that we do need to care about people that work. You have people who were once a supplemental worker or a TPT, then they become full-time. They forget about what it was like to be a supplemental worker. Or, you know, someone who's a, not no longer one tier and they forget what it was like to when they first started. So that was not what the union is about. I think so our strategy is make sure we believe, we're teaching in such a short time frame, teaching our membership and the world what it means to be in a union and to fight for everybody, not just the auto worker and the, that's for everyone. So again, those are strategies. Um, I love when, I'm not, I know a lot of memberships ready, they, we, trust me, I hear it in my region. Everyone is ready to go. Why, why not our plan? Why not our plan? I will say this, guys. <laughs> we don't want to break the bank of the strike fund. We did raise it, so it's a little bit better. But that's the strategy because that was a heartbreak for uh, GM workers. GM workers, I would say in my region, they was like, please don't let it be me. Please don't be. They're ready to support it, but they was, you know, that 40 days did some damage. And it was very hurt because 250 was not a lot of money. But with the $500, it helps, but it, it has to go a long way. It also covers your health care and a lot of things. So we got to play chess, not checkers. So those are strategies. We have to learn to believe our leadership. So the ones who are on strike are doing the heavy lifting for all of us. And that's what it said, the strategy of not working the overtime, putting things together, making sure we're supporting our brothers and sisters who are out there. And I believe me, it's, I've seen it as amazing. But this also helped our negotiators to go back to the table. And and because they see them, we're they're coming out to the lines. When I was a negotiator, we didn't go to the lines. We weren't physically talking to the people. Of course, I talked to the people in my plant, but that's part of negotiation. This is required of our VPs to stay active with the people, the membership. This is all strategies of building a better union. Um, so striking, like I said, so everyone's ready to go, but. We don't, just stay ready. As Sean say, stay ready. Your number may be called, but everyone knows strikes are still hard on people themselves too. So he's trying to also be supportive of our memberships and our brothers and sisters. Those are all strategies, guys. And then it's also, I will say this, 
the company is noticing our strategy because they have never put out updates. So if you're a Stellantis on here, you're a GM, as of today, they're telling you, telling us the membership, oh, ask your leadership, what was the offer? My question to them on their strategy that they want to say, where is the offer that you provided? Because if you're leaving one person behind, we're not doing it this time. There is no more behind. So our strategy is our membership. That is the strategy. Building a strong membership, building strong communities. Um, our research team is the best. We have looked at other industries and things that they try to villainize us because in the media, they always made the auto worker the bad worker. Not this time. Another strategy that we got ahead of the game of. Your story is not there. Everybody want to know why you CEOs are making money. No one is pointing at the auto workers. So these are all strategies to get us a good contract. These are all the strategies that we need. Yeah, thank, thank you, LaShawn. That was so, yeah, I, I feel like you've touched on so many things that the UAW is doing so drastically differently from um, you know, previous decades. And um, so thank you so much. I think now we're gonna hear um, from uh, a handful of workers um, out there on the picket lines about the strategies uh, they're using um, to uh, build up the strike and help win the strike. Um, and the first person uh, we'll go to is Megan Fagan. Uh, and I'll let Megan introduce herself. And I'm going to try to keep it moving along in this section because we want to hear from from every worker. So um, please just take a few minutes to, you know, tell us what you've been doing. And uh, yeah. Uh, so Megan, go ahead. Uh, Megan Fagan, Little Jeep, Local 12. Um, one of the both easiest and um, inspiring things we've done is we've had convoys and we've had them, a couple of them in at least in the last seven days. We started, the first one was organized just from the need of somebody saying, hey, are, are we going to come through? Is, is somebody going to come through and support night shift? And within two hours via social media, we had 10 minutes worth of cars lined up and ready to go. And um, it was it was tricky navigating um, the logistics and how we were going to move it and safely was most important, moving those people through and getting them to um, our plant. But it was something that just grew and it went from a a two hour planned event to then we were going up and doing one for local 900 and then they came and did one for us with the Broncos and it even turned into our our supplemental employees wanting to show love and be a part and and make a movement for their own and the full timers went out and we blocked traffic for them so they could have a moment and show show the picketers their support and that they were grateful that we were all fighting together it's been an opportunity to to not only teach but show what the word solidarity means it has brought everybody together in the most major way and in the simplest form yeah <clears throat> yeah thank you so much megan um and again uh mm -hmm. we had some i just want to remind everyone we had some uh we were showing a video at the beginning of the call uh of these convoys and i really recommend everyone to go check out that video. Um, yeah, the link should be uh, in the chat and we can post it again. Um, so next we're going to go to uh, Cisco Garza, who is uh, at the same local, uh, Atlantis Local 12 at the Jeep Toledo plant. So Cisco, can you tell us uh, about what you've been doing on the picket line? Um, basically trying to hit every every place, you know, once a day, go there to different things, hangs out with, there's a lot of my family works here at Jeep. So I go to there when they go up to do the, the picket line, I go with them. And then I plus I go over to Fleet because that's where I originally came from is Fleet. So I go hang out with my brothers over there and sisters over there at Fleet. 
and, you know, just trying to keep the spirit up. You know, I cook them breakfast, stuff like that, you know, talk to them, trying to talk to the younger generation, you know, what's going on, why we're fighting, you know, show them the way so they understand what this is all about. It's not just to sit out there, you know, and, you know, about certain things you got to tell them, you know, you guys want your pension back. You guys want to get rid of the two tier system. You know, that's the biggest thing around here. You know, you, you got to fight for everything because when you're at Jeep, you know, it, your livelihood's all there. You hardly spend any time at home. You're more there. So you, they're like family too. So you trying to help them out. just like you do your brothers and sisters at home. You know, you tell them which way to go and hopefully they follow that path, you know, for strength. And, you know, the Jeep, and that's the first thing I came out when I went out there at 1130 to I stayed up. I was up, but I worked at 1.30 in the morning the day before, and I stayed up all the way up and waited till Sean Finn said, uh, hey, we're going to strike Toledo Jeep. So I left here from White House, Ohio. That's 36 miles away. I mean, 36 minutes away from the plant. Got there before they got out of there. And that's where I came out. And uh, when Lewis came up to me. I said, you know, I think, you know, and it's true because it's the best product in the world, you know. Let's show these people what we really think. Get these Jeeps around the plant. Show everybody. You know, if we could do it for the Jeep Fest, we should be able to do it here in droves and show them around the country. Because anywhere you go in this world, you know, you always see a Jeep. That's the main car of every country is Jeep, especially down in Florida, California, all over. It's, you know, it's an icon product, you know. It's a reason that it's here. So, you know, we got to show people here in Toledo, you know, and worldwide, you know, why we want what we want. We're not asking a lot. We're just asking our share fair and that's it. And looking at the younger generation and thinking about their generation beyond that. Thank you, Cisco. Um, uh, it's a lot of exciting stuff happening at the Salantis plant out on strike. Uh, next, we're gonna hear from uh, Shauna Shaw, who was at the GM plant out on strike. You wanna introduce yourself, Shauna, and um, what's, going on in, uh, at the picket line. Hi guys, my name is Shauna Shaw. I'm a UAWD member as well as a UAW Local 2250 member in Wentzville, Missouri. What's going on on the strike lines? Um, Unity. It feels like a family reunion. It feels completely different since 2019. Um, our members have their boots on the ground and they're ready to go. They're chanting 40, 30, 18, 6. Corporate greed has got to go. I'm there every day. I'm an elected official. So my roles and responsibilities are a little bit different. I feel like I'm a flying squadron where I'm out to the lines. I'm out to the gates. We mobilize, we rally, we bring food, we bring drinks. Um, it's a different feeling of upleaf. It's a uh, mess around and uh, feign out is another one they like to yell. Um, Cause we can't say another word, but um, the atmosphere is quite amazing. I do want to thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a whole different atmosphere. I do truly feel people have become alive at this point in time. Um, we're eight days into this and people aren't wavering. They know that they have leadership that's standing for them and standing with them. So that makes a huge difference. We have a massive rally tomorrow scheduled at three o'clock as well as our convoys are gonna start on Wednesday. Um, we had to look into logistics of it and for the safety reasons, um, we are off of pretty, I know it says Highway A, but it is a pretty major highway. Um, the camaraderie is pretty, pretty strong. Um, we're ready to hold out until we can't. And I don't think anybody's gonna be able to say the word can't. So we're in it for the long haul and whatever is needed. Um, we were honored to be chosen and our members are holding out. Well, thank you, Shauna. That's so great to hear. It feels different from 2019. That's really- It's night and day. It's night and day. The mobilization, I'm sorry, the mobility and the feeling and everybody's inspired. They're feeling heard for the first time. It's the members' demands. So when they were talking about the strategies, you feel like you're a part of it. Everybody has to say, I've never seen so many people in our parking lot listening to the announcement by President Fain, where we had our whole shop committee standing around a truck and we hooked it up to the speakers of the truck because we're all working, we're all running around. 
but it's time stood still and you're seeing everybody putting their fists up in the air and like, yeah, and just that atmosphere is completely different. It's the communication, it's the participation, it's we know we're making a difference and it's not just for auto workers. It is for everybody that's living paycheck to paycheck. It's it's not just us. And we feel like we're standing out on the line making that difference for everybody. Yeah, thank you, Shauna. Yeah, y'all are making history. Um, all right, next we're gonna go to a Ford worker um, at a plant that is not on strike, but as Sean Fain said, you can fight just as hard if you're not on strike right now that um, as, you know, uh, as if you were on strike. So um, James, um, do you wanna introduce yourself and tell us about practice pickets at your plant? Yes, how are you doing? I'm James, I'm from 862 KTP in Kentucky, right out, right inside Louisville. Um, we're here, I mean, we hear you guys up north and south and all around us, and we've been ready. Like these practice pickets, they've been, they've been escalating. We've had a couple so far, and the last one we had, I feel like it tripled the first one. The support we have from the community. We see Walmart and UPS drivers and their semi trucks laying on the horn when they walk when they roll by, and we love it, especially when we see it from Walmart. That's not something you usually expect because we feel like we're talking for them too. Even though they're non-union and they're they're not going through the same thing we are, we're kind of fighting for them, and maybe they can get something better in the future. I mean, KTP here and all you UAW brothers and sisters. We sacrifice blood, sweat, and tears every single day. We come to work. We work hard. And one of my favorite quotes is from Remember the Titans, attitude reflects leadership. So when you see us out there fired up, it's from years and years of getting beat down. Our attitude is a direct result of what's happening in our leadership and how we're treated daily at work. I'm looking at forms saying, oh, we're doing mindless work, that we shouldn't deserve this. Well, when you got a, a first year person coming in as a temp, Three, so uh, two to three years, um, and they're getting the same kind of wages that uh, people are flipping burgers at Chick Fil A. That's we're tearing down our bodies. This is super hard work, and people don't realize that. And I challenge anyone to come do one of our jobs for half a day and tell me you're not sore, tell me you're not hurt and beat down. And then when you do get hurt and you have to go out and you're treated like dirt, like it's just it's it's mind boggling to say that we don't deserve to get a fair contract. So this year, it's it's basically a boil over from the last contract. We didn't deserve that last contract. That contract was trash. It should have been thrown out. Um, and so we're here to fight for it this year. And I love it. Um, another thing, I'm just fired up right now. I'm getting chills thinking about this. I'm sorry, but I could break this table in half that I'm looking at this computer on right now because the stuff we've been going through when I started at Ford almost eight years ago, it was like they considered it to get in here to be a lottery. And I was just like, that's what everyone in this community look up to. Like everyone says, oh, you're at Ford. You are that, you know, you're that person in this community. And now it just feels like we went backwards, like Fane said. When I got here, I thought they cared about us. I was like, this is the best place I've worked. We're treated. We're getting good pay. And that money's not adding up anymore. And then one day I just woke up. I saw a girl pass out because we didn't have air conditioning. She passed off from the heat. And the first question the supervisor asked was, can someone else do her job? I ran over to her, gave her a Gatorade as she was getting up, but he didn't check on her. He was trying to hit the line to get it started going. And that doesn't sit right with me. That's some morality issues. And that's where your attitude reflects leadership. And that's not just dependent on that supervisor, but it's also dependent on what he's hearing on his walkie from the headquarters and CEOs, because they're on them the same way our supervisors are on us. So. We got to fight for this. And some of our supervisors, they might not say it, but we know. And they might say it behind the walls, but they're fighting with us. Thank you, James. You got me kind of emotional too. <laughs> um, uh, okay, that was a great group of workers we just heard from. Uh, we're gonna hear from a few more before we go to Q&A. Um, so members of Unite All Workers for Democracy, the Reform Caucus that propelled uh, Sean Fain, LaShawn, and our current reform leadership into office, and is now organizing uh, to build the strike um, and supporting workers um, who are uh, organizing 10 minute meetings, practice pickets, rallies, uh, refusal of voluntary overtime. So um, I'll turn it over to Scott Holdison. Um, 
uh, to start. And Scott, you want to introduce yourself and uh, what UAW, explain what UAW is doing now. Well, first of all, thank you to the 170 people that have uh, joined to learn about the, the UAW strike. Uh, my name is Scott Holdison. Uh, I, I am a uh, worker at Ford Chicago Assembly Plant. I chair the steering committee for UAWDM, one of the founding members. Uh, I want to thank you, give a, a big thank you to uh, Labor Notes for inspiring us for uh, uh, years uh, to keep this moment uh, movement alive until the moment was there for us. But what UAWD has been doing uh, to prepare for the contract campaign. We started back in early summer uh, preparing for this contract campaign. Basically, as soon as the bargaining convention was over, we started organizing uh, for uh, teaching what a contract campaign is because it was foreign to auto workers. We uh, held workshops, uh, we held online workshops. Uh, those were first. We did online contract campaign trainings. And then we transitioned to uh, in-person contract campaign trainings and uh, taught the people that were watching the, the uh, video presentations to do them in person with their coworkers and start building those uh, escalating tactics to put pressure on the companies. Can you hear me all right, Lisa? Yep. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, and uh, you know, so we, we were building the escalating tactics way back in the beginning of the summer when the uh, international was trying to uh, uh, get consensus on what kind of a contract campaign uh, they were gonna get behind. Uh, we, we got out in front of it and started pushing it from the ground up. So we had a ground up strategy and uh, then we went uh, into uh, sending out informational leaflets uh, basically to agitate members about what had been given up over the years, what they had lost compared to what the companies could uh, afford to give us. And those started to get members excited about a contract campaign. And then we started doing trainings on uh, 10 minute meetings. And uh, you know, the next speaker is gonna uh, tell you about uh, how those 10 minute meetings uh, really came, came all together in uh, Local 862. Uh, but uh, we uh, learned from the uh, Teamsters at UPS how to practice picket. You know, their contract expired, uh, was set to expire July 31st. And we got out there on their practice pickets and learned from them and took those lessons back to our membership. Uh, then since the strike uh, has uh, happened, we've been working on uh, organizing flying squadrons getting members to support the picket lines. And uh, we have a, a pledge, an online pledge to uh, refuse voluntary overtime. And we're continuing to support the contract campaigns in, in locals that are not on strike, uh, encouraging them to continue with the practice pickets, uh, continue with the rallies, and just keep building the pressure on the companies to win us a great contract. Because we all know that the power of the union comes from the shop floor. It does not come at the bargaining table. The bargaining table receives their power from us. So the more prepared we are, the better deal they're going to get. Uh, and uh, I want to say their names. Uh, you know, we've, we've touched a lot on Sean Fain, but let's not forget the rest of the UAW Members United uh, slate, Margaret Mock, Secretary Treasurer, uh, Mike Booth, Vice President, Rich Boyer, Vice President, LaShawn English is here with us today. Thank you, LaShawn. Uh, Dan Vincente in Region 9 and Brandon Mancia in Region 9A. Uh, I'm just so thrilled with the performance that they've all been uh, uh, doing for our union. And uh, I I'm going to wrap it up and uh, send it back to Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Scott. I believe uh, Scott may be uh, calling uh from a uh, from the plant so thank you for taking the time to to call in today scott um that was very well said one more thing uh so you mentioned the refusal of voluntary overtime this pledge i understand it's really taking off um, a lot of workers in the plants right now are choosing to refuse voluntary overtime 
and coordinating with their coworkers to refuse it. So as to, you know, not, not do the boss any favors right now. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Chris Budnick. Uh, Chris, you want to introduce yourself and, you know, tell us how the 10 minute meetings are going. Yeah, absolutely. I might throw a couple extra plugs in there, but uh, my name is Chris Budnick from local 862 uh, Ford Kentucky truck plant. I'm also co-chair of the steering committee of UAWD. Um, yeah, I just want to plug in that, like that, just a little bit about my history of being, uh, I've, had, I've had to go through four plants with Ford, three in Michigan, and then in 2016, um, I moved to Kentucky. Uh, I've been with Ford and UAW for 11 years, and I'm super excited, <laughs> just overwhelmed with how much progress we've made as a union and as a uh, membership. Um, <clears throat> but I, I like to touch on, um, you know, tears a little bit uh, before I go into my 10 minute meetings. Um, you know, that's the number one issue for me. I'm a living, breathing concession. I'm what was uh, given up uh, so that the big three can make it through the bankruptcy, right? And the thing is, is the plant I was at before was Sterling Axle. And it really hit home yesterday when, um, when I found out that they're gonna come to parity. Sterling Axle, they're the tier three, I call them, uh, cause they only made it, you know, 24 bucks an hour uh, after eight years which is crazy so it really hit you know it really hit me hard yesterday seeing that they're coming to parity along with you know everyone else that was really um very inspiring um to see that and see you know the progress that we've all made as supporters and union members uh, especially you know uh, with uawd uh so as Scott was saying, you know, uh, with the 10 minute meetings um, at our plant, at my plant, I just started, just started. I, I, I didn't think about it. I just, I just kind of went with a, 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 an example format for an agenda and started asking folks to come on into the break room before work um, and then and let's go. So 16 people showed up to my first meeting and I was nervous, you know, um, but it's not a big deal. I just went with the, went with the agenda, worked it all out. And I, now I run these meetings every single week and I did them all throughout the plant, uh, throughout my department. Um, sometimes I do surprise meetings. I'll just show up, especially with skilled trades. They're 12 hours a day. You know, they don't really have a break. So I just, I just go in to their break room and just, chit chat <laughs> you know just talk about the contract get everyone riled up but my main purpose was uh you know i, I used ups as an example uh the teamsters what they've been doing the practice pickets i was getting everyone uh, ready for that but the main thing the easiest thing folks can do wear red on wednesday you know wear the strike button every day and it's such a great thing to see folks um in the plant um, wearing red on Wednesday. And, and then so there's a lot of folks that are just wearing the buttons every single day. I'm like, this is amazing. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the 10 minute meetings progressed and they built, I think, I think the most I've had was 26 folks in my in a meeting. And, um, you know, I've, I've had all types of speeches, especially after, cause everyone was really mad when we didn't get called out for strike at KTP, <laughs> even me. Um, you know, I had to wrap my head around it and understand the strategy. And I, I just, you know, I, I have a speech of, uh, you know, the toolbox, you know, uh, Teamsters were able to use every tool in their toolbox, you know, and then when they had their last tool out saying, we'll all go on strike if you don't give us what we want, you know, and they had a, you know, they had a very historic contract. Um, and then the, uh, but for us, we, we haven't had that much time. It's new to us. Contract campaign, we got to get everything up and rolling. As uh, Brother James White said, you know, we've been doing practice pickets and all that. Um, and this strategy allows us to use the rest of those tools in the toolbox, you know. And if we get to that last tool where we have to all go out, so be it. We'll see where we are there. So 
Um, but one thing I want to mention um, about the uh, something I realized yesterday um, is that all these years, all these contracts, I've only been through a couple contracts, but a uh, pattern contract was always shoved down our throat. You know, Ford was never first. Um, it was always shoved down the member's throat. And having Sean Fain um, leading and uh, encouraging engagement of the membership, making this all happen, we're all making this happen together. You know, for once in our lives, uh, the membership is shoving down, I was basically gonna end up shoving a pattern contract down GM and Stellantis' throat if Ford ends up getting a really good contract first. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's huge. That's a big, you know, tides have turned. It's wonderful. I'm excited for it uh, to see what happens next. But that's kind of like what I see. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Um, so it's just, I don't know. It's it's great to, to see, um, I don't know, people feeling happy about the progress um, being made at Ford. Um, Next, we'll go to Mary in Buffalo. Mary, you want to tell us about practice pickets and rallies uh, at your local? Sure. Um, my name is Mary Ost. I'm from Buffalo Stamping Plant, Local 897, um, Ford. Uh, we've had several practice pickets at our location. We've had we've had uh, one for each shift. Um, we just had people come out. They could ask questions. We um, we did like a practice walkout and we all carried our signs and the amount of people beeping their horns was amazing. Um, and then that leads into uh, like we had, we answered people's questions, which there's so many rumors out on the floor. So that was imp an important part of that practice picket was answering people's questions. Um, but then we went back into the plant and everybody is talking about it. Everybody's talking about the practice picket. Everybody's talking about the contract. It has the, the consensus in the plant seems to be one of backing up Sean Fain finally. And um, we were also a little upset that we didn't go on strike, but we do know that that is part of the strategy and we are waiting in case we need to. Um as far as the rallies go, uh, we are scheduled, I think we're scheduled to do one next week. We haven't finalized our plans yet, but I feel like the practice pickets were the knowledge and the education of people is the most important thing that we as a union can do. And I think that that was whoever came up with the practice picket idea is a genius. <laughs> so I, that's, yeah, that's pretty much what I have to say, but it has opened up the lines of communication immensely in our plant. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I think I think we can thank our the Teamsters for inspiring a lot of UAW members to, to take this on. Um, and I, I think everyone has been so insightful about just why it's so important to have these actions leading strike. And, you know, even if your plant isn't strike like why these actions are so important you know they're building up the membership and education and communication and the readiness um so uh final speaker before we go to q a uh is marcy pedraza um marcy uh you want to tell us about um practice pickets at your local hi yeah so thanks for having me labor notes been following for for years now um and first, I want to give a shout out and uh, solidarity to all my UAW family that's on the picket line right now. You know, we stand with you. We're still standing up. And I, I like to say I'm still standing, you know, ready to to walk out if, if we have to. Um, uh, like she said, my name is Marcy Pedraza. Um, I'm an electrician. I've been a union electrician 24 years. But I first started in uh, UAW. I'm also a member of UAWD. Um, I started 10 years ago. I worked at, uh, for the time, Fiat Chrysler at Belvedere Assembly Plant. And then I've been at Ford Chicago Assembly Plant for seven years, local 551. And I, I just want to get on some of the issues first that, you know, we're still wondering about um, with Ford anyway. But, you know, like the pensions, I don't think that's uh, been announced yet. What's going on with that? I'm sure we'll hear something soon. I hope uh, retirement health care. 
uh, shorter work weeks, you know, everyone's burnt out, like working um, almost every day, 10, 12 hour shifts, you know, and, and as for me as an environmental activist, you know, um, I like to see a just transition to EVs, you know, that's something that's important too. these plants aren't organized yet. And, you know, green jobs should be union jobs. So um, as far as the organizing, uh, I first started with, you know, just passing out campaign literature for a contract campaign. And, you know, then with the buttons and the stickers, and the next thing I know, you know, uh, people are asking me, hey, do you have any more buttons? Or where, where do you get these buttons from? You know, and we ran out at some point. Um, and then we were doing uh, strike trainings at the hall. And we did like two or three of them, I think. And everyone got bigger and bigger, like more people were coming out. You know, people were asking questions, like, even the people that didn't go, like, can you do, can you post it online? Can you do a Zoom? You know, and then we we're doing, we've had three practice pickets so far. Um, and they have also were getting bigger and bigger. Like, we've had local electeds from our aldermen all the way up to, you know, U.S. Congress uh, representatives coming out. You know, the Reverend Jesse Jackson came to our union meeting. And, uh, you know, so yeah, it's safe to say that people are fired up, you know, definitely in Chicago. And, you know, I'm just coming from the, uh, we had our region four women's conference in Ottawa, Illinois. And, you know, we were watching the live stream yesterday morning and, and everybody's on edge. You know, I've heard that it's kind of like, you know, waiting for the draft, like who's going to get picked next, you know? And so just great to see like, you know, that people are interested and just waiting for these updates. You know, the transparency has been great, you know, and as uh, one, uh, somebody was saying earlier, like this is, not just about UAW, you know, it's about all workers. And um, and then just watching that video again in the beginning of this uh, meeting, um, that really resonated with me about the Jeep because I have a Jeep, you know, I'm, I bought it 10 years ago. You know, I was proud to use my discount from Chrysler. And now every time my car makes a noise, I'm dreading like, oh, I don't want to have to buy a new car because, you know, they're so expensive. And even with the little discount we have, you know, I don't think I can make that extra payment a month, you know? So, we, you know, people have been saying like our wages have been stagnant, but in reality, they've been going backwards. So but again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Marcy. Um, so that was great. Um, we've heard from so many rank and filers and uh, now we're gonna open it up to Q and A and we have a bunch of questions. I'm gonna been taking a quick look at them. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, let's, um, start with Lorenzo's question. So I'll read that out loud, um, for those who haven't seen it. Um, are the UAW workers being educated that the eyes of America are on them? We are rooting for your victory because your victory is our victory. So and this is a question, anyone, if you want to jump in and answer are, uh, you know, are UAW members aware that, you know, all eyes are on them? Oh, we're fully aware. We have news crews around the clock outside of our gates trying to get into our hall. Um, and we know this issue is not just auto workers. We know it's the rank and file of every American. I don't know anybody that's not living paycheck to paycheck. I don't know anybody that doesn't have to pick up more shifts and work a little bit harder and work a little bit harder. And it makes me so emotional to think that this is acceptable, that the society that we are in, that this is acceptable. We should not have to kill ourselves any longer to live like this. It's not just us. It is everybody. And the UAW, yes, it has always set that standard. It has always set that benchmark. And that's why they are fighting us tooth and nail. And that's why we will continue to fight back into our last breath, until the last breath that I can scream, because it's not just about me. I tell them every single time. The reality is I have in my mind that my daughter is going to go to college someday, that my daughter is going to buy a home someday. That my daughter is going to fall in love someday and have a family. But the reality is, is she going to be able to? If we continue the way things are right now, that is not a possibility. That's why we are fighting. It is not just for us. It is for all. I'm tired of seeing women and men struggle at the grocery store just as I am because they can't afford their groceries. 
that they can't afford their bills. It's not just our issue, it's society's issue. But the difference is, is when they ask me that question, I tell them that the UAW members are tired and we're taking a stance and they could join us. And if they don't believe in our 40% wage increases or how do they get that, I tell them they can join a union because we're the ones that are gonna be fighting. So they know, they know all eyes are on us and we're gonna be allowing them to watch us because we are gonna set that standard for America. Because when the international made those signs that says saving the American dream, that is exactly what we are doing. It's like here at Jeep, you see, uh, you know, everybody sees it. Every, you go down our picket lines, you go around our building. It's so huge. It's a box around. You see, not only our people see it, but our city of Toledo sees it. They come out in droves, support us. They beep horns. We got the fire department. We got Toledo police coming by us, beeping the horns thing. I mean, Everybody sees that the eyes on on the big UAW. They're not just saying Ford. They're not saying Chrysler. They're not saying GM. It's the UAW. It's all three. And that's what makes this very historic on, you know, the point. If you look at reality, it's never really been done that all three went out at one time. Everybody's seeing it. And we're not just seeing it here in Toledo. We're seeing it over there and where Ford's at, where GM's at. You see it across seas. You see it overseas. You see it everywhere. Everybody's coming out supporting us. You know, that's the best part about this. That's what everybody talks about. I know here at Jeep, that's what we talk about. When we're in the picket lines, walking, doing the thing that we got to do. Everybody's talking about it. And they're seeing how, hey, did you see CNN was here? Did you hear on the news that uh, Solantis is here? And Jeep, you see about Jeep, how they're bringing out the Jeep. You know, that's what all the younger generations finally getting to see with the, like, I ain't saying I'm old, but, you know, I've been with the old timers. I've been where Parkway is before it got destroyed. So I got to see the first hand where everything was hand manual labor. And then you come here and it's more ergonomical. You know, I see the difference in between the two. And that's where I try to educate the little, the younger generation. Hey, this is what it's like. If you guys don't change, you got to fight for what you want. And that's where the eyes in the world comes on you. And they don't understand the hours we put in. Like here, the power plant, you got people that works 10 hours. Then you got the mechanics. They work from 12 to 16 hours, seven days a week. And then like when COVID strike, everybody was at home, but the mechanics, painters were all in and millwrights were all in working that, you know? And that's what people don't understand. That's the kind of lifestyle we got to deal with. And we're willing to do it to help our families out and make our thing. I'm, there's, my uncle was in first, I was second. And then now you got my wife, my son, my daughter, my cousin, my brother, my sister. So you're talking generations here of people, each one, not only here at Chrysler, Ford, GM, just like uh, the one guy was talking about. And I'm sitting there like, wow, they're talking about the management, how all that is. We got the same thing here at Chrysler. They're dealing with the same thing down there in Ford. You know, and that kind of hits reality. You know, it seems like everybody's the same. And that's what I'm saying, you know, so we do understand. We see it all. Yeah. Um, thank you, Siska. I just want to maybe uh, get a couple more perspectives on this. Um, Megan, do you want to comment on this general question or like how aware are people on the picket line of, you know, the fact that workers all over the world are watching? Can I respond to that? <clears throat> Lisa? No that was LaShawn. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I was going to give Megan a chance first. And, oh, okay, let yeah. Megan go. Go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. I don't. I, okay. No, it's fine. I, my connection might be. Oh, I was going to say that's okay, LaShawn, because I was like, <laughs> it was. It was. It, uh, um, it, it broke up a little bit. But um, they are very aware, and that's why they are. Um, standing strong and they're energetic. And when Sean touched on that, this, this whole thing is different than it's ever been done before. Right. Um, gone or now are the times where, yes, we're on the line with our music and we're, we're cooking food for each other and we're really making it family style and <clears throat> we're keeping the energy high 
and we want we want the world to see us to know and understand that this, this is a fight this absolutely is a fight and one we're not taking it taking lightly but we are we are out there and we are strong and we are going to bring a good energy and in in be in solidarity with our city and with ourselves and we're showing that we can be out here on a positive vibe at all times Oh, thank you, Megan. And yeah, LaShawn, go for it. Now, what I was just going to add to it on a, on another note, as being a director, so some of the things to make sure that the membership was aware is that I made sure we had training and I did media training. And I expressed to my membership because this is the time that you want everyone to talk. We were taught to don't let this person, don't let this, no, everyone needs to tell their story. That's how you hear. So I, I think that... um as people were telling their story, because I can't say in the beginning, I did go on a couple of, and it wasn't, it was still a lack of education on some areas where we went. I'm not going to talk, I can say more areas of um, leadership was more aggressive. And the more aggressive, I'm um, like 551, five, some of you locations out here, Toledo, presidents and stuff, and some of those, those locations were very good locations. And when the world is start watching us, is they're at all the picking lines. I mean, you cannot go nowhere that the media is not following you. And then when I will say three times at, at the rally that we had in uh, Michigan, we had people from everywhere in the world there. I mean, I was surprised we had people from Brazil fly over. So if you don't know, or we had uh, people from Mexico, because which we met at Labor Notes, Two years ago, I mean, well, a year ago in Chicago, they came up to our rallies and they came to the picket lines. So I, I think as we see in ourselves, this is a, this was so different about this time is, is that our people are out there. We're on the news. We're so I, I think that helps us to be more aware because again, if you were most of us in the auto plant, we have went to sleep. So is you know, you still like, is this real? Is this, you know, how does this feel? We still didn't think the world really concerned about us. And I think the more realness it feels, because there's no time that I can't turn on the news. There's no time that I don't see one of you guys on a UAW international website. I don't, if I could on, click on the X, you know, the Twitter or something. We're out there in positive numbers. So I think that also make us self-conscious aware that we're being watched. We're being watched. We're being watched. And it's in a good way. And I think that we want, and the leadership shining us, as we continue to say, not just the auto workers, it's all workers. And I will say this about labor notes. It's the best conference that I've ever been in, I've been to. It teaches you that you see outside your box and we do have to start caring about each other. So I think, as he said, watching the world, I think just knowing that each one of you guys, the things that you guys are doing, it lets me know that we are worried about the rest of the world. So teach one, grab one. I love it. I really do. I do. So we are worried. We are here. And the guy on there, tell him, we are. We're, we're, we're ready for to help everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that, Lisa. <laughs> I get pa I'm like, I get passionate. It's like, like no, Megan right. and Shannon have said, you just, you can feel, it's just a different kind of feel. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's a feel of pride. I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. It's just amazing. I don't know. It's amazing. Lisa, can I say something? Um, yeah, sure. I just want to say that there, I don't know if everyone can see there, there are a bunch of questions. I'm just trying to keep on top of it. I think we're going to get to like a couple more. So sorry to everyone whose questions aren't going to get answered. Um, but I, I'm just going to, so after Shauna goes, I'm just going to try to get to a couple more. Go ahead. Um, this is just real quick. The reality is, is we actually have communication this time and it's not hush hush. So the world is seeing what's going on and they are hearing what's going on. And that gives us a power and that gives us a voice because they're finally seeing what we're actually dealing with and the realities of the truth of our contracts and what has happened and what we have given up. And then they see that we're just like them. We're no longer on this pedestal. 
they have the reality that we're just like them. So I think that the world does need to watch us. And I think we do need to tell our stories, just like Lashana English said, it's very important that we t speak our truths. So thank you. All right, thank you, Shauna. Um, all right, so uh, we got a number of questions on the same general theme of how supporters outside the UAW can help. We got a question about, you know, is it possible to donate to the UAW Strike Fund? Uh, to my knowledge, I think it's not. Um, uh, we got question, but you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we got questions about, you know, how can I find the closest picket line to me? So earlier, um, we shared in the chat this map showing uh, where all the picket lines are. Um, we can reshare that. Um, and I was wondering if anyone might want to just um, like want to answer that question, um, and then we'll, we'll move on to another question after that. Well, my my best suggestion would be um, is to call the locals and ask what they need. Um, we've been, I know at Local 12, we've received huge support from the community. They are constantly um, asking us, what do you guys need? We don't know. Um, I know the line, the, the picketers on the line. This morning, um, our one of our local restaurants, Rudy's Hot Dog, donated um, a bunch of chili dogs. It's a big, it's a big restaurant here, even though it's locally owned. Um, and we went and picked them up and just took them out to the line and passed them out to whoever wanted them. And that's something that um, I know they love, and they it, it makes them feel supported. Just bringing anything to the line and just handing it out to people, they'll always take it, we'll always be appreciative. And then if you're not sure, please go ahead and give our locals a call and they can direct you better on anything that um, our, current, our, our current needs might have. Well, thank you, Megan. Um, it's our region one, we got a thing of need because our Blue Cross. So I will say this, and it, the public has been very good with the big three, but we also have other people that are on strike, like the Blue Cross, Blue Shield. And this is also affecting our IPS plants, which a lot of people may not know. So that hurt, and they're not, they only get unemployment, so they're not receiving a lot of money. So I would suggest, uh, like I said, I have a lot of politicians dropped off, but um, some of your regions also are setting up. I would say region one, I'm gonna speak on region one. We also start a food pantry and a lot of our members go to Costco's and just have the Costco drop it off at the region. So anything, but I'm agree with Megan, please um, go to the local halls and call the local halls and do that. It's nice to drop off food on the line, but I will say, Please be very cautious of some of the lines when you're doing it because some of the areas are on high traffic. So, and it's easier to drop it off at the local because we have strike captains who will give you the ability to make sure that people get what they need. Because a lot of times when people are on the line, that's, they're just on the line and we have captains. But um, Region 1 has on our website a list of things that a lot of members need. And like I said, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and Lansing, Grand Rapids, and Detroit areas on strike. And there, it takes them, people may not run, it takes them 20 years to get to top wages, guys. 20 years. So, I mean, so if you want to give, look at the list, but I also advise you to um, go to the local union halls. The, that is the best way. Okay, so just thank you, Lashawn. Just to summarize some of what people have said, um, you know, reach out to your the closest. Uh, so we just posted uh, the map of the, the live map of, of the picket lines um, uh, and the UAW locals on strike right now in the chat. So reach out to them. Uh, many pickets are running twenty four seven. Uh, so uh, organizing groups of people to go out onto the picket lines. Uh, and bringing needed supplies. Um, uh, so the UAW uh, strike fund is not uh, accepting donations. Um, a way to support some of this organizing 
uh, that's happening uh, that we talked about is to donate to UAWD, which is helping a lot of workers right now organize practice pickets, meetings, um, and refuse voluntary overtime. Um, and I think let's just do one more question since we're running running a little long. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, one thing we've touched on a lot, but I don't think we've really directly asked everyone. So what are what are some of the top, and we have a lot of questions about this, what are some of the top issues um, in the contract that, you know, you'd be looking for, uh, hopefully to vote on it in a tentative agreement? Um, I want to uh, start with James, if you want to uh, answer that, James. Okay, so Fane mentioned um, trying to get these 32-hour work weeks where it's kind of confusing. I think a lot of people believe they're thinking we're going to only work 32 hours, I guess, with not even three days a week. Um, but I think it's more or less that we're going to get overtime after 32 hours because we work so much. A lot of people don't realize we're not like a normal nine to five. So if we're going in at 6 a.m., I don't know where the other plants do. We go in at 6 a.m. here and we get off of the potential of about 5.30 to 6 p.m. That means I live two minutes, two to five minutes from work. Um, a lot of these people live an hour from work and then you factor in traffic. That means they're up at the crack of dawn. I mean, 3.30, 4 in the morning on the way to commute to work. Who's taking their kids to school? Who's getting their kids on the bus stop and getting them ready? And what about these single parents who can't get their kids to daycare so they got to hire someone and like for my instance, I don't have family in Kentucky. Uh, my girlfriend does, so we got grandma here, but not everyone has these things to fall back on to take care of their kids. And then with the JCPS school system, the bus is messing up this year. Um, first week or two of school, the buses were running so late, they weren't even, the kids didn't even get home some of them until 10 p.m. So just imagine the amount of time you're getting with your kid and your the amount of time you get with your kid directly um, it directly impacts the your community. I mean, when kids don't get enough attention, I come I come home. I'm six p.m., seven p.m. I'm standing on my feet. I've been on my feet since four in the morning almost. And now my kids want this, want to do this, want to do that. You know, wants to play. Wants to, and then you're exhausted. And so we're just trying to do things where we can get more time with our family and get back to being a family. There's so much thing going into work, and a lot of us like. Another thing in my instance, a lot of me, like I and a lot of people on my team work several other jobs. So I've been two jobs for about the last 15 years. So I'm working six days a week. I'm, my kid's having a birthday party right now. So after this call, I'm going straight to a birthday party and then I'm going straight back to work tonight. But it's just we want to be able to enjoy the fruits of our labor. They want to give us just the labor and no fruit. So they don't, it's hard to get time off. Like we want to be able to enjoy what we do too. We don't want to just every day work, work, work. We want to have a life. So that's just one thing I wanted to pitch in. I can comment on that too, actually, because I mean, that's something very important to me, you know, as a working mom, one parent household, you know, like you said, we just want more time with our families. You know, we shouldn't be living at work. We should be living at home. And like, you know, it's a, uh, it's just crazy, you know, after you work some, you know, people work five, six days a week, you have one day off maybe to, you know, run errands, clean the house, make food, you know, and then, then you're exhausted, you got no time to rest, you know, our physical health and our mental health is taking a toll, not to mention the kids mental health, especially during this pandemic, you know, we need to take care of, of each other and our families, or, you know, it, it's just, it's not going to look good for, for our, you know, people in, in anywhere in the long run. So we need to be able to, to take care of our families, bottom line. All right. Um, I think uh, we're going to move toward wrapping this up. Um, this has been a really amazing call. We've heard about how, um, you know, this is not just for UAW members, it's for our whole communities and for workers around the U.S. and, and the world. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna screen share this map again so everyone can get a visual of all the facilities that are out on strike right now. It's really from coast to coast. Um, okay, there we go. It's from coast to coast, you know, so not just in Michigan or the Midwest. And 
who knows, maybe it'll escalate uh, even further than that. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the link to the live map has been shared a few times in the chat. Um, please take a look at, you know, where the picket lines closest to you are and make an effort to go out and, and support the workers. When UAW uh, workers uh, stand up, uh, we're all standing up with them. Um, so with that, I really want to thank, again, all of our amazing um, UAW workers and, and panelists uh, for joining us today and um, all the participants uh, from around the world who, who joined us. And uh, the link to the recording will be available. Um, it'll be up on our website and we'll make sure to share it out. So um, uh, thank you again. Um, and we'll, we'll wrap up now and, you know, we'll see you all on the picket lines and let everyone get back to their organizing. So solidarity. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Solidarity. Thank you, everyone.